Border interviews with Christopher Brown. I am your host, Christopher Brown, and today we are talking Ontario election 2022. We are going to be diving into the biggest stories, the biggest news, heading up into our live edition of the Cross Border Interviews on Thursday, June second, at 7:45. Mountain Standard Time. So today we're going to be talking about what we saw, what we heard, and the state of affairs four days out from Election Day, that is May 20, May 30th, 2022. So with that, I want to start with this. <clears throat> Sorry. As you can probably tell, my voice is a little bit cracked right now. Over the last week, I've been talking with candidates, supporters, uh, you name it from Toronto to Ottawa and everywhere in between. We have tried to cover this election as best as we can in a short period of time. Now we have some stories from the road. We have some information that we wanna give you, some of our findings, some of what we've seen on those doorsteps, and also some of the conversations that we had with some of the campaigns. Now, we will try to be as accurate as possible. We may not know who the person that we were speaking to with, but during our tour of East Southeastern Ontario, we met with a lot, a lot of campaigns. And we are going to try and do our best to identify those campaigns and the staffers or if we talk to candidates. Because we did actually have the chance to talk to one or two candidates during the week tour. And I'm pleased that we had that opportunity because we got a fresh sense of what they're seeing on the ground. But also comparing it to what we saw on the ground. Because over the last week while we were out collecting buttons, talking to people, collecting signs for our election day special... What we were also doing was getting information. So we were driving in the streets of uh, certain cities in Toronto, up in Ottawa to see the state of play for politics, whether it be how many lawn signs are in a certain riding in a certain area. Is there a big swing in certain demographics? And I'm looking forward to diving deep into that because we, we, this is our first election that we're covering since since our new rebrand of the show. And I'm honored to try and do this as a, how do I put it, a fresh face. Because I haven't been in Ontario in a while. And when I was driving around, I can tell you, it was different. It was different to see all the different uh, changes that each of these cities. I hadn't been in uh, Ottawa in a while. We went back to my old stomping ground of Belleville. I was in Clarington, which I'm originally from. And then we also did a deep tour of on t Toronto, which last time I was there, it was such a liberal safe haven. The 2018 election has changed that. And we saw things that we didn't expect to see. While well, also talking about the one campaign stop that I was actually kicked out of because I was the media and they weren't invited to a public event. But that's here nor there. We'll talk about that later on in the show. Um, but I'm looking forward to this next 45 minutes to deep dive into the uh, Ontario elections from my perspective. Now, about 15, about half hour into this, we're going to be bringing in Sarah Biggs. She'll be talking about, uh, we'll be talking about the Ontario elections from our perspective, from an Albertan's perspective, but also from an Ontario resident and a former Quebec resident uh, perspective as well. So I'm looking forward to this because I, I love politics. Anyone who knows the show and has been paying attention to the show, we love to have conversations with every candidate, anyone who's out there. And we did do a disservice to one candidate who was trying to get onto the show, but we just didn't have time. We were trying our best to make sure that it did fit in. But 
when you only have an iPhone and a Canon camera with you, you can't really do a live show on the fly. So I do apologize to that candidate from Toronto, Danforth. Uh, I wish him the best. He's a registered nurse and he's running for the new blue party. So uh, I'm wishing him the best coming from all the way in Alberta. Uh, I know Toronto Danforth is Peter Tavins, the NDP candidate, uh, NDP MPP for a long period of time. So it is an uphill battle for him. And from what I understand from his staffers who we, we are in contact with, Peter isn't in the riding. He's out doing other things and he's out canvassing in other parts of the province. So I'm looking forward to this. Now, there's going to be a few more breaks than usual. And that the only reason that is is because my voice is going and I don't want to get into a period where you are listening to me and you're going, oh, his voice is gone. So uh, we're going to take a quick break here and then we'll be back right after that to talk about Toronto. The once liberal safe haven, the now PC NDP liberal split that could affect a majority or a minority per, uh, government in the next legislature. So with that, we'll be right back, guys. Calgary, Edmonton, Vegreville, St. Albert, Drumheller, Medicine Hat, Fort McMurray, and Peace River. These are some of the communities this show has been heard in. By advertising with us, your advert will be heard by countless Albertans and Canadians. Visit the link in the show notes to advertise with us today. When we decided to do this journey, the one thing that we wanted to do was get a, a sense of what was happening on the ground before we actually did our live election series, election night special on June 2nd. And we decided that seven days was going to be enough. Over the long weekend, it's usually when advanced voting's happening the week before the election. And we wanted to get a sense of, like I said, what was happening on the ground. So we flew in to Toronto Saturday at about 8 o'clock at night. Now, as you can imagine, after a four-hour flight, I was kind of exhausted, so I went right to the Marriott uh, Westin Hotel uh, by the airport, which FYI, if you're ever flying to Ontario, highly recommend because it was one of the best, if not one of the greatest night sleeps of uh, in a hotel that I've had in a very long time. So I would highly recommend that you do, if you go to Toronto, go to the Westin by the airport because a round of applause because it was quite an amazing experience. Uh, we booked our car through Avis, which is a great, another great uh, event, another great uh, company that we want to make sure that we give a special shout out to because we got a great deal with them. Uh, if you do do uh, do rent cars when you're on uh, uh, flying, go with Avis. They'll give you a great discount, great deal, and just great all around service. So we had the car, we had the hotel, and we had a good night's sleep Saturday. Then Sunday hit, and if you know me, I'm up at the early hours of the morning on Sunday, or on any day, but this was kind of special for me because this was the first day I was actually going to get out. This had been a long time coming. After two years of being in lockdown, I was ready to tour. I enjoyed touring, and I really wanted to get at it. So I took my uh, my... <laughs> trusty iPhone, trusty tripod, trusty binder with all my notes in it, got in the car, and I wanted to start e west to east. So what I did was I started in Mississauga and Brampton. Now, I'm going to start off by saying this. I'm an early riser. When I've ran campaigns, and I've ran campaigns here in Ontario, uh, here in Alberta, back to Ontario. When I've ran campaigns... I am in the campaign office 8 o'clock in the morning. I don't know why, but it just was because there's a lot of things going on, particularly with two weeks left of the election. Sorry, I'm just going to take a drink, drink of water there. I got to my very first campaign office at 9.45 Sunday. Now, with two weeks left of the election, you think, you would assume, people would have a little fire under their ass. Not for the Liberals, the NDPs, and the Green Parties uh, in Mississauga and 
Brampton. It wasn't until 2 o'clock when I found a campaign office open on Sunday. Now, I understand people are religious and they go back to, um, what's the word I want to use here? They go back <coughs> to the days when Sunday was God's day, so you didn't open up until mid noon. But in a campaign, sometimes you have to give God a rest and you have to do what you need to do to win an election. So you are there early. You are the last one. You are the first one in as campaign manager, last one out. Like I said, two o'clock, and it wasn't until Brampton Center that I found a campaign office that was open, and it was the liberal candidate there. Now, I, I, anyone who's watched the show knows I was a Ontario liberal back in Ontario. I married an uh, Alberta NDP. I ran federally liberal. I've worked on conservative campaigns. I've worked on liberal campaigns, and I've worked on NDP campaigns. So. Going in and asking for a button or asking questions when you're not really media because you're just some online show that's trying to make its own uh, dent into society and democracy is quite hard. But I went in to this uh, Brampton Center liberal headquarters and I asked the question that I was going to ask every campaign that I stopped. How's it going? How's it feel on the ground? And this campaign worker i don't remember her name she was very nice and she openly admitted it's hard because volunteers are hard to come by because we're still in a pandemic but overall momentum's on their side now brampton is a ndp pc hold right now and the pcs are looking to make inroads in brampton because of the 413 issue which is we're going to build a highway through 413 and it's going to get alleviate some traffic on some of the interior roads and that's going to be great. The NDP are, hey, we don't like the 413. The 413 is bad because you're paving uh, wetlands and that's not what you need. So when this campaign staffer for the Liberals said that there was momentum on their side, I kind of believed them because when I was driving around Brampton Centre... Now, it could be the area that I was in. I should I should mention that right now. There was a lot more liberal signs than I anticipated. Being out of power for so long, being a party that has no kind of relevance in the uh, at Queen's Park, I wasn't expecting much. But when I was touring the side streets, the downtown cores of at Brampton Center, I kept on seeing liberal signs. And I was going, what is this? There was a few liberal, there was a few PCs, there was a few NDPs, there was even a few blue signs, new blue signs, sorry. And I just couldn't understand it. So I thought maybe it's just strong candidate, I don't know. So I went and put my way and I went to the NDP camp candidate, which is literally like five doors down, which is great for me, but probably awkward when you're seeing... A guy come out of the liberal headquarters and go into the NDP. NDP was open. I went in. I had the exact same conversation. Do you mind if I have a button? Can I have a sign? They're like, sure. Okay, here you go. Uh, but I will have a question for you. How's the momentum? Because I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the NDP Brampton Center is held by the NDP. So I asked the question, how is it feeling on the ground? She goes, it's great. The incumbent is doing incredibly well. We got some momentum behind us. So I'm like, oh, okay, that's great. Like, it's great to get feedback from people. And I know that's what they say, right? I'm not bullshitting you by saying that this is not what they're not going to tell you. Because if someone comes in with a microphone, you're going to tell the bullshit lie of, oh, everything's great. We got great momentum. She's a, there's a, they, they are a strong candidate. It's perfect. Everything is great. But the Liberal campaign was just opening up. This one looked like there was a meeting going on. But also there was some people looking like they were trying to figure out what to do next. Now, I'm not privy to the information that was at that meeting. Uh, I did not try to eavesdrop because I just don't think that's the appropriate thing to do. But I got a sense that, and I know that's that means nothing in today's age, but I got a sense that... <clears throat> they were planning out their next two weeks. And 
it didn't look good because maybe I was seeing what was happening on the ground and they were too. The liberals were picking up steam from when Kathleen Wynne left. Andrea Horvath at that time wasn't doing well. Andrea Horvath had just been tested positive, so she was off the campaign trail. So this whole Brampton Center was the epicenter of where the NDP were faltering. So I did want to pry too much, but I asked one last question before I left. And the question was, who's your biggest challenger? Doug Ford being in power for four years or this the, the re-rise of the Ontario Liberals. And they didn't answer the question. They just sort of laughed it off and said, oh, she's going to win. And I was like, okay, so either you, you are kidding yourself and that there's no challenger or there's actually no challenger. But by the way she laughed it off, it made me feel like there was actually a challenger, just they didn't want... Maybe they saw me come out of the Liberal campaign and come and do theirs. Who knows? But I found it quite interesting. What I saw on the ground, compared to what the people told me, the Liberals might take Brampton because they may not be ready to give Doug Ford a chance. They might not like Andrea Horvath after four years. Who knows? I did get to the PC candidate's uh, office, and there was a gentleman there. <laughs> there was a dog, actually. There was a gentleman there. He looked very much like the candidate. And I said, oh, are you the candidate? He goes, no, we get mistaken by a lot. And I was like, oh, that's quite interesting. And I said, how's it going? And he goes, you know what? I'm here early because I've always been told, you do not take your foot off the gas pedal if you think you're going to win. And I was like, okay, this guy's telling me something that I didn't expect. He's telling me that the the PCs may be having may have some actual backing and may some have some polling numbers that Brampton with the 413 might actually go PC. And I'm not I'm not discounting that because it could. Doug Ford is a popular premier. He he is one of these premiers that you will vote across party lines just to vote for Doug Ford. So I am interested to see if uh Brampton Center, the one area that I got to go to all three ridings, will, will actually go the way that many people expect, PC. I'm going to say it's going to be a close PC liberal split with the NDP possibly going up the middle. But I don't, I'm not counting out the liberals yet because what I saw on the ground when I was traveling and touring and yet again, one section, one poll, one 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 community in Brampton Center, it made me feel like maybe the Liberals might be able to pull off one or two seats. Now, the pollings do not say that, but polling has been known to be wrong before. After we left Brampton, because we got a few signs in Brampton, we did not Brampton South, Brampton East, Brampton West, Brampton North, and Brampton, I'm not saying the exact names, but we did the Brampton ridings. After that, there was an event downtown, and this <laughs> this is where this is where things get a little tricky for me, because I am I, I consider myself just an online show. I don't try to be uh, I don't I don't don't try to do the gotcha journalism that most people do. Maybe <coughs> maybe we are journalists. Maybe we aren't. I don't know, but. I can tell you that this was a interesting, very interesting event that I went to. Saturday night, I got notified via Instagram that Emergy, uh, sorry, I apologize, that the Green Party of Ontario candidate in Beaches East York was having a public event with the leader of the official opposition and PEI, Peter Bevan Baker, Bethan Baker, or however you pronounce his last name. Now, I, I'm a fan of every politician. Like, I, I, as I keep on saying to people, I people go to Disney to get autographs of Goofy. I go to uh, political events to get autographs of politicians. Now, I went to this event thinking, okay, it's going to be open to the public, maybe CBC, CTV, because a high-profile person coming into the riding, you, you might want to get some coverage. I got there, 
And I don't know how to properly describe this, but the best way I can describe it is imagine a gazelle walking into a lion's den. The lions are all going to perk up and go, who is this? What's going on? What's happening? And I'm not one of those people to cause ruffles. So I said, oh, uh, hi, I'm Chris Brown. I interviewed uh, the candidate uh, on season one of the show, which we did. And I, I understand the leader of the Green Party of uh, PEI is in their area. And I was wondering if I could just come in and just see and check, see, hear what he has to say. Now, <laughs> so <clears throat> I try to be nice to everyone. Everyone, they said, oh, you can sit down. I said, okay. Every time this woman came over, I said, oh, I'm in your way. I'm, I apologize. I don't want to be in your way. Like, okay. People are coming up. Are you going to come out with canvas? Like, no, actually, I'm going to go meet a family member, which I was actually, actually going to do. And then it looked like the campaign manager walked over to me. Might have been an office staff or a person from the GPO. I don't know. But they walked over to me and they said, can I talk to you outside? Red flag, right? Because you know, you know, you know where this story's going. You know exactly where this story is going. Can I talk to you outside? Without a beat, I said, I'm getting kicked out, aren't I? And they're like, well, we didn't get approval for media. <laughs> I'm like, then why, what, why, why promote it publicly if you didn't get approval for media? I didn't say that, but I get again, being the nice guy I am, why didn't you get approval from the media? Like, it just doesn't seem like something that you would not check before publicly making that announcement. And... I'm <laughs> how do I, how do I put this? How do I be nice here? Because the candidate's a really nice guy. It just the campaign staff wasn't. I said, if you want me to leave, I'll leave. It just seems weird that you're asking me to leave because I have a tripod and a camera stand. Yeah, that'd be best if you could leave. They said, and I, I went okay. And. As much as everyone was very chummy chummy with me as I was there, as I got there, the attitude changed. And now it was, mm, we're not talking to that guy anymore. Why would we talk to that guy? That's, that's, that's not something we do. We, we wouldn't talk to him. He's the media. So I was like, okay, well, <laughs> that's here nor there. I'll leave. It's not like, no skin off my back. There's no skin off my back of me not covering this event. It would have been great. I would have had great coverage because I was the only media there. But when you have a big name, you think you would want that information out. When you have someone like the leader of the official opposition in PEI coming in while Mike Schreiner, the leader of the Green Party of Ontario, is out due to COVID. And then you say, no, we don't want you here. That's here nor there. That's them for you. And I give them credit because they think they can do it. Beaches East York is not a bastion for the Green Party of Ontario. But if they think they can win it with no media coverage, good for them. I wish them the best. I got a button out of it. <laughs> so really, at the end of the day, that's all that matters. The next area I'm going to talk about after the quick break here. Because after that, we went out. I went out to for family dinner, caught up with uh, my niece who lives in downtown Toronto, and I decided I was done. <laughs> I did Brampton, I did Mississauga, I did Beaches East York. I was done. Over with, let's go home. <laughs> let's just relax because it's been a long two years, a long uh, day of just driving around because I don't like Toronto driving and it's not my favorite, but I did it. So I left. Went off to uh, lunch or, or supper lunch. Then went up to the uh, West Inn by the hotel, which yet again, highly recommend you check it out. And we slept. We actually slept. It's been a long while since I've actually been able to get home and just crash, but that's what I did on that day. So um, we will be back. And after we get back, we're going to talk about Monday. Because Monday was an interesting day where we did 
out of the 23 ridings downtown Toronto, I think we hit all but two. So we'll be right back to talk about the stories from the campaign trail in good old-fashioned Toronto. We'll be right back, guys. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15-second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. Now, one of the biggest things that I want to mention about day three of this this tour that I was on was before I left, I decided that I would do a spreadsheet of every single campaign office that was in public domain that would give out information. And I would search the PC website, the Ontario Liberals, the Ontario NDPs, and the Ontario Green Party for any campaign office that they had in the ridings in Eastern Ontario. So yet again, from Mississauga, Brampton, all the way to Ottawa, I would search high and low to find campaign offices that I would be able to stop in. So I wasn't searching on the road. I was just going to go do it and do it quickly. The one thing I found was the Ontario PCs were very hush hush about their campaign offices. So I didn't get to go out and get to check a lot of these campaign offices for the Ontario Progressive Conservatives and Doug Ford. Now, that's not saying I didn't get to a few. I did. It just it was harder to do the Progressive Conservative uh, tour when there wasn't that many to be found. So I, being in all my glory tried my best to get to as many campaign offices to have these conversations, to collect buttons, collect signs in a short period of time. Now, day three was Toronto. I planned on doing Toronto. I planned on getting through Toronto and I planned on getting the, the majority of it done. Now this, this leg of the trip, I brought my niece along with me. So I picked her up at uh, Monday morning. I think it was about 10 o'clock and we decided to get on the road. So we did Parkdale High. We found the Liberal, found the EPC. And we did basically a big loop on Valley, uh, up York, up to uh, 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 Willowdale, across to Don Valley, down to Beaches East York, Toronto Centre, to University of Rosedale. And we did a lot. And it was challenging. Again, I am not a fan of downtown uh, Toronto driving, but I will do it if uh, if I can get a campaign sign, get some comments, and, or get a button. And I found the, the, the more I went to these campaign offices, A, some just don't have buttons, some just don't have signs. But as I toured the uh, offices, I also toured, like I said, the actual communities that they're there to represent. And Toronto uh, went a weird way. They elected Doug Ford in Etobicoke. They elected uh, some NDP in York. The, the former liberal safe haven of Toronto was no more. So it was one of those moments when, how do we put it? When liberals were making ground the NDP were faltering in some areas and I'll talk about that in a few minutes and the PCs were picking up ground because if you remember Doug Ford his brother and him were were counselors on the Toronto Councillor in 2010 to 2014 before Doug ran for election of mayor and lost to John Tory he was a sitting councillor in Toronto, Rob, Rob Ford, is still well-liked in downtown Toronto. Love him or hate him, he is still a well-liked man. And it was interesting to see some areas with more conservative signs than I traditionally had ever seen. Now, as a former Ontario Liberal staffer, I have seen Liberals come and go in downtown Toronto. I've seen NDP rise. I've never seen PCs traditionally do well in downtown Toronto. But the further out from the downtown core you got, 
the more what's the word I want to use? The more conservative signs you would see on rural air on on actual private properties. One particular is York, which Michael Ford, Doug Ford's uh, nephew, is currently running to be a PC. If you go into his writing, he is plastered that prop that writing blue. So I do not expect the NDP to hold that running. It could potentially go to the uh, PCs or, as we've seen in the past, the PCs and the NDP could split. Liberals come up the middle. It could happen. I'm not holding my breath on that one, but it could happen. Traditional strongholds like Willowdale, like downtown uh, University of Rosedale, Toronto Centre, if you go into the heavily dense populated areas of apartment buildings, it was harder to find some signs because camp apartments don't usually traditionally put signs up, but the more uh, traditional suburbs of these ridings, you saw the rise of the NDP, the rise of the Liberals, sorry. The NDP are the Toronto Centre, Tor University of Rosedale, uh, Toronto Danforth, uh, beaches East York. These are all traditionally liberal safe havens, except Toronto Danforth. That's kind of a outlier there, with uh, Peter Tibbins. But you you saw I saw more and more liberal signs in the more subdivision areas, the areas where there were tr houses and there were properties. And the reason I say that is because you would see the big giant NDP sign, but then you'd see four houses with liberal signs. You'd see a big giant NDP sign, four houses with liberal signs. You might see a green, you, and especially in University of Rosedale. You might see a new blue. You might see a um, Ontario party. But for the majority of it in the downtown core, and I mean traditional Parkdale High to Tro Beaches East York, all the way up to University of Rosedale in that area, that is traditionally a, a liberal stronghold. And there were... The comebacks of the liberals going on there. This could spell some trouble for the NDP. I'm not saying it will. I'm just saying it could. So I'm watching this area quite well on uh, Thursday. If the NDP do badly in these areas, that means the liberals are going to pick up seat and they could potentially become official opposition. If the NDP want to form government and potentially stay on as official opposition, they will need, they will need to keep these areas. Davenport uh, is one of the areas that I saw. It is a budding NDP metropolis now since the uh, MVP, I don't remember her name, but <coughs> she has got that riding locked up. I am not expecting Davenport to potentially go anything but NDP on election night. That being said, I'm not expecting the traditional strong liberal writings of University of Rosedale, Toronto Centre to go NDP. I'm thinking they're going to go liberal this time after the four-year absence because of the Kathleen win. We're not going to win. Vote for as many liberals as you possibly can scenario. The more and more conservative areas, though, the Willowdales, the Don Valley... I saw more liberal signs on there. Now, the only conservative uh, riding that currently is held by the uh, progressive conservatives in the Don Valley is Don Valley North. Don Valley East and Don Valley West are currently held by uh, Michael Coteau, who is now a federal MP, and Kathleen Wynne, who is the former premier who is retiring. The liberals have these places locked up. I am not expecting them to go anything but Don, but liberals in the next election on Thursday. So do not expect any surprises there. The one I'm going to be watching for, though, is Down Valley North. I think the Liberals have a good chance of picking this up. From, the, from what I saw on the ground, from the areas that I was in, it looked like the Liberals were doing well. It could be the areas that they were doing well last time, but maybe not this time. So I'm going to keep an eye on that. That's going to be my big uh, suggestion, my big uh, look. So I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens in the downtown. I, I, I'm i not going to be uh, overly optimistic that the Liberals are going to come back and pick it up. I'm not expecting the NDP to pick up any more seats than they traditionally have. They might actually lose seats. The big story of Toronto is going to be Doug Ford. Has Doug Ford pleased enough people in the, the 416 to potentially pick up more seats? 
I think it's a yes. I do think it's a yes. And I think Doug Ford is going to potentially bring some votes from the NDP, which could spell disaster for the NDP and the PCs, because if he doesn't bring over enough with these unions that he's talking about, that he's gotten endorsements from, with the labor movement that he's gotten endorsements from, this could spell trouble for the official opposition and the government, and the liberals could actually be a beneficiary of a strong PC Toronto uh, vote. A weak NDP vote would turn into a liberal gain in some of these areas. And the ones I'm saying, and I'm going to I'm gonna make the prediction right here, right now, you're listening to this, Parkdale High, University of Rosedale, Toronto Centre, Fort Spadina, York, um, and I want to say Beaches East York, but I could be wrong, and Don Valley North are the six ridings that I'm predicting right here, right now, will flip to Liberals in the next, uh, on Thursday after polls close. Now, I could be wrong. We have our live election special that's coming up here on Thursday, where we're going to be talking with Sarah Biggs and former NDP MP Dan Harris has graciously accepted a roll back on the show to come talk about the election, the results, and where the parties go from here. So, um... I want to take another quick break, and then we're going to come back. We're going to talk about our trip out to Ottawa in Ottawa. And then we're going to take a, a day break. I know I said I was going to do a bit of a uh, uh, <coughs> uh, recap with Sarah Biggs, but I'm going to wait till Tuesday to do that because, well, we gotta we got to spread this out a little bit longer for you because it's Ontario election night, and we got to talk about the big stories. So we'll be right back after this brief message from uh, not our sponsors, but actually one of our uh, just placement ads, just so I can get a drink. And we'll talk about Ottawa. And then after that, on Tuesday, we'll talk about rural Alberta, rural Ontario, which is Napanee, sorry, and Nepean, all the way down to Northumberland, Peterborough South, including Durham. So with that, I want to take a brief moment, and we'll be right back after this, guys. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite. Be sure to hit that subscribe button today to be kept in the loop of all the great episodes that are coming up on the show. Also, click on the links in the show notes and follow our social media pages as well. Hey, we're back for our last segment of Monday before we take a break and we'll be back Tuesday with the rest of the trip and a little bit of an in-depth analysis with Sarah Biggs. Um... I want to talk about our trip to Ottawa. So Tuesday morning, we decided that we wanted to get to Ottawa as quickly as possible. Now, for those who have been watching the news, which I wasn't because I was touring, Ottawa had been hit by a big giant ass mother mother fudger storm the weekend before. Down power lines, outages, a lot of uh, damage to the area. So I was going into an area that I was relatively unknown about because I did not work in Ottawa. Uh, I did not, like, I, I worked in Parliament Hill, but I did not work on the outskirts. So I was trying to figure out how this was going to work. I went into the uh, riding. So we drove up four hours later. We got there. Four fun hours of driving. We got there. We started doing a tour of the Parliament Hill. Then we started to do some button and collecting. Now, I started south and worked my way north. So I went to Ottawa South, which is currently held by John Fraser, which is kind of a weird story in itself. So I'm going to mention this before we continue on. So when I went to the John Fraser uh, writing office, I was expecting, okay, I just want a button. I want to talk to somebody, and I would just want to see what was there. Fun little tidbit. It's a small world in Ontario, which is ironic because it's quite one of the largest provinces in the Confederation. I got there and I was introduced. I met a gentleman who knew my mother. We got started talking. I said I was from Durham, from Clarington. I was from Newcastle. He said, oh, I'm from Curtis. And so we had this back and forth. And we found out that he had gone to school where my mother was a secretary. So it was very uh, serendipitous. So we had a brief, long conversation about that. All the while, asking the questions that I wanted to ask. How's it feel? How's everything going? And he said, John's a good MPP. He's well-liked and he's well-respected uh, in the area. So it's probably going to go liberal Ottawa South. So 
I have nothing to say that it won't because as I was touring some of the side roads and some of the rural areas, because remember, a lot of the power outages were still happening. Street traffic was at a standstill. It was actually really bad in some areas. I, I feel bad for them. I know some people are still without power, still without uh, water in, in Ottawa. So I wish them the best over the next few weeks as uh, things, the next few odd days, hopefully. But I, I sat there. And I was listening to a guy who knew that he was in a good position heading into the next election. And his campaign office was a buzz. Was a buzz. Now I say that because they must have just gotten back from a campaign stop because I saw John Frazier in the actual office. Now I didn't get a chance to chat with him because I had some other things that I had to do. But I saw him and he looked he he looked in good spirits. And I know the can, candidates, and I've yet again done enough of these to know that Candidates know if they're going to lose or going to win. And it looked by from him that he was going to win. So I gave him credit where credit was due. And I gave him a big uh, round of applause. And I was out of there. Because I had to continue on and try to find some conservative campaign offices in downtown Ottawa with no campaign records of where their offices were. So Ottawa Center, Ottawa South, I think is going to go... Um, is going to go liberal. The one I'm not 100% sure about is Ottawa Centre with Joel Harden. Joel Harden is the current MPP, NDP MPP, for the riding of Ottawa Centre. Now, Ottawa Centre, yet again, was formerly held by, yeah, uh, I forget his name, but the former Attorney General of Ottawa, former President of the Ontario Liberals. He's a well-liked man. You tour some of the streets in Ottawa Centre and you get a sense that NDP is well liked in Ottawa Centre. Now this is a riding federally, the Ottawa, the NDP have always tried to win. Catherine McKenna stopped that. Uh, I don't I remember who the current, although actually the former ND, MPP is now the MP for the Liberals. <coughs> so the NDP love the fact that Joel's in this. Uh, Joel's office is well advertised. And I think he's going to win this. If the, if the Liberals sweep Ottawa, which they're anticipated to do, they will sweep all but one. Because I think Ottawa Centre is going to be the writing that a lot of people are going to be surprised at when they actually turn up to vote, when the votes start counting in. Because I think Ottawa Centre is a safe NDP writing now, or it could not be. But I'm predicting right here, right now, that the Ottawa Centre writing is actually going to go NDP. And I say that knowing that I've been wrong before, but I'm willing to take this bet here. Um, Ottawa Orleans and Ottawa Nepean, we went there. We were not not able to find any campaign offices open at the time, so we were not able to get a good sense. But what we did do, we did the tour of the interior. And that's why I said the liberal sweep of Ottawa. Ottawa is a safe haven for the conservative for the liberals and i do not expect any surprises on election night when the votes start coming in when it comes to the other five ridings that make up ottawa the only one that i'm going to be watching heavily is ottawa center with joel harden so while we have been talking for the last 40 minutes which after commercials and all that 40 minutes i want to say that Ottawa, Toronto, there's a few fights. I think a lot of lot is predicted. I thought that Ottawa would be more up in the air, but with the trucker convoy, with everything going on there, with the power outages, with Doug Ford's handling of the convoys, I don't think it's going to be a sweep for uh, Doug Ford in Ottawa, where I think he's going to do it overly well and compensate for Ottawa, is Toronto. Ottawa currently only has one MPP, PC, MP, MPP, which is Jeremy Roberts. And I don't think he's going to win re-election. I'm going to be completely honest on that one. I think the Liberals are going to sweep that riding. 
where I think the PCs are going to potentially pick up a few seats is downtown Toronto on the outskirts, the Willow Dales, the Don Valleys. I could be wrong, though, as I've already made my predictions. The Liberals are going to pick up a few. The NDP are going to hold a few. The PCs are going to hold Etobicoke. They're going to pick up a few in York, probably. If not, they're going to split and let the Liberals come up because right now the Liberals only have two seats in Toronto. Don Valley West, Don Valley East. Scarborough is another issue. We'll talk about that later on tomorrow's episode. But I want to thank everyone for tuning into this episode. I know it's another episode of me just chatting. I promise tomorrow's going to be a lot easier where we talk about our rural trip and we do talk about Derek Sloan. So you do not want to miss that. And then we will be talking about the new Blue Party and where we saw a big uh, surprise surgence of them in a certain riding in the GTA. So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. We'll be back tomorrow with another great episode. And we'll be back tomorrow with Sarah Biggs. So please tune in because it's going to be fun, fun, fun. Chat to you later, guys. Keep talking. Thank you.